so it's almost the weekend for all of you. <laughs> yes, working day is done. <laughs> weekend is here. Which basically mm-hmm. means more of just sitting at home itself. This can't go anywhere, can't do yeah. nothing. So it's, it's just sitting at home without the work to do. Mm-hmm. More, more Netflix and chill, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hoping to finish up on Castlevania tonight. Oh, cool. Well, I'm waiting for my child to be a little older. She's 11 going on 12. I'm like, well, a couple more years and we can watch, you know, yeah. Castlevania and Evangelion and all of that. We're watching the less intense ones now. Like we watched Naruto and we're currently watching uh, Full Metal Alchemist. Oh, which one? Uh, the first one or Brotherhood? Uh, we watched the first one a couple months ago and now we're starting to go through Brotherhood. Ah, okay. We'll do both. <laughs> yeah, I guess we can we can start. I think people will slowly join in. Super, yes. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Until Inside Science Fiction Book Club. And today we are entering the machine hood with SP Divya. Few things before we begin. Uh, please keep your mics on mute. If you have any questions, please uh, type them into the chat box and we'll take them at the end of the session. My co-moderator today is T.G. Shanoi. T.G. Shanoi is an SFF enthusiast, columnist, and critic. He is the writer of India's longest running weekly SF column, New Worlds Weekly for Factor Daily, and the Specfix column for Bangalore Mirror. He also curates the SF track for Bangalore Litfest. He has featured in podcasts such as the Tale Harete Kannada podcast and even such as Sri Lanka Comic Con to talk about SFF in general and Indian SF in particular. He hosts To Boldly Go, a fun SFF quiz every Saturday. He is also an advertising and marketing professional and is currently creative director at pub- publicist Leo Burnett. Today we are talking to the marvelous SB Divya. S.B. Divya is a lover of science, math, fiction, and the Oxford comma. She is a Hugo and Nebula-nominated author of Machinehood, Runtime, and the short story collection, Contingency Plans for the Apocalypse, and Other Possible Situations. Divya is the co-editor of the weekly science fiction podcast, Escape Pod, with Muir Lafferty. She holds degrees in computational neuroscience and signal processing, and worked for 20 years as an electrical engineer before becoming an author. Find her on Twitter at Divya's Tweets or at sbdivya.com. Welcome, Divya. Um, Hi, thanks for having me. Shannon, would coming you like over. to get us started? Yeah, so uh, as I was just saying before we went live, uh, we're here to talk about this book right here. And I am just like, waiting to wave it in everyone's faces and say, please read it. That's that. This is Machine Hood. Uh, that's the uh, book uh, and whose ideas we are here to discuss. And uh, uh, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, a, a brief uh, intro. Uh, so the book is set in 2095. Uh, it's about 70 odd years from now. And uh, it's a world in which uh, bots and wise or weak AIs are, are commonplace. And uh, there's a bot for everything, uh, right? There's a care bot, there's a nanny bot, there's a medic bot, whatever you think of the, of course, there are uh, factory bots. They're there to do all, all the work. Uh, and where does this leave people uh, of that world? Uh, for the people of that world, you have... Uh, uh, pills to help them keep up with these machines so you have <clears throat> pills which are known as flows which help you focus better you have the zips which make you uh, more active and run faster there are buffs which help give you uh, temporary uh, enhanced strength uh, and there's jewels which help uh, rejuvenate you and it's a world in which you can make vaccines in your uh, kitchen yeah. uh, right so this is the world and another uh, 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 thing, another feature about that world is the ubiquity of what we would call surveillance. Uh, right? You are on camera all the time. Uh, if not yours, then you are, there's micro drones all over. So anybody can just peep into your life with you doing anything at any time, which I, I mean, anything that you do is 
on 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 camera and there's there's really no privacy but the people there seem to be happy with it probably because they've uh, sort of grown into that world and which was for me the best part about uh, machinehood is that the world sort of feels very uh, lived in uh, and the novel centers around uh, two key protagonists Velga who's an ex marine uh, uh, army person who's now uh, a bodyguard for these rich pill funders uh, and her sister-in-law Nitya Balachandran who lives in Chennai uh, and there's a terrorist attack in which one of uh, the p- person that Velga is uh, 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 guarding uh, dies and that sets her on a path to figure out who it is. Parallelly, she's feeling these, these little tremors and she asks Nitya to figure out what's wrong with her medically and that follows the second strain or the second uh, uh, subplot or the sub- second plot of the book and they all sort of converge. And, and in the middle of all this, what uh, Divya has managed to do is also bring in the whole point of how we look at intelligence and what we think of as, as intelligence and what the dividing line is between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, yeah, as, as much as I love uh, science fiction, I also love, love action thrillers. I also like mysteries. So uh, Machino ticked all those boxes for me. Right there were, there, there were the ideas without the boring info dumps. Uh, there was action and there was mystery trying to figure out who's behind these terrorist attacks and the machinehood claims to be behind it all. So who is the machinehood? That's what Velga is out, out to discover. So let me just stop talking about the book now and ask you, if you are, so thank you for, I mean, for me, machinehood, like I was saying, came like a breath of fresh air. It isn't completely dystopian. It isn't all gloomy and doomy. Uh, it's not a post-apocalyptic hellscape. Uh, it, it's very human. And there's, there's so many ideas that are just sort of packed into it. And somewhere there, you manage to update Asimov's three laws as well. right? There's, there's AI, there's gig economy, there's the whole labor rights thing. How did you manage to pack in so much? And, you know, or did you start with, okay, I want to, take all of this and pack this all in. I mean, how did machine come about? I mean, how did you manage to walk that fine balance? So um, I did come up with most of the world up front. Uh, I spent about three weeks researching in depth um, what people think are going to develop in terms of science and technology, ideas and innovations over the next 50 years. And kind of extrapolated that a little bit further forward. And I really uh, upfront wanted to kind of examine this existential question that we're dealing with um, today and have been dealing with, I would say for the past decade, which is uh, with increasing automation with the digital world, uh, what is going to happen to our current labor force? Where are things going to go? What kind of work will people be doing in the future? Because that's a big looming question, especially in the tech sector, which is, you know, where I've been working for most of my life. And, um, and kind of put that all together, actually, um, as part of my notes, when I was developing the world for this book, uh, decided to go kind of decade by decade and just have like a, a few sentence summary for how we get to the world of machinehood from where we are today, you know, assuming, like I said, no, nothing catastrophic, nothing apocalyptic happens, no asteroids are crashing, no aliens are showing up. Um, I mean, these are really, really fun things to explore as well, right? The disruption of current society. But for this book, I really wanted uh, like a continuum, you know, where could we be headed? What is a realistic world we could live in? Definitely did not want to write either a very idealistic future nor a very terrible future. Um, A lot of people think, you know, we're living in a dystopia today, right? Especially in in certain parts of the world, there's this feeling, this sort of um, lack of hope for the future between climate change, between conservative politics uh, resurging. And so that kind of got my mental gears turning. And I was like, well, what is a vision of the future that seems, you know, perfectly ordinary 
to the people of that future. They've accepted it. They live in it. That's just what they have to deal with. Uh, that might seem a little bit terrible to us today, but not too terrible, you know? Just like today, we have things that are very, very good, and we have things that we struggle against. And so all of that kind of came together. And um, and like I said, I, I ended up developing most of these ideas, including the micro drones, um, the pills, the, you know, the level of artificial intelligence and robotics that is available in 2095, the degree of settlement uh, in space, because science fiction, we all love space travel. And, you know, we can see with the commercialization of space where that could possibly be headed. So even there, I kind of wanted to keep it to what I think is possible in 75 years, though, given what's happened in the last 75 years with space travel, I would say that's probably my most optimistic vision in this book is that, you know, we'll have about uh, a dozen or so space stations, you know, with populations of several hundred residing on them full time. Um, that's probably the least likely to happen of, of everything in this book. But, but I think it could happen, you know, if humanity really decides that that's what we want, um, I think we can make it happen. So yeah, so all of that kind of came together up front. The, the stuff that I struggled with was um, the thriller and mystery and plot uh, aspect because I've never written a thriller before and I, I don't recommend choosing that as your first novel. It's a really, really hard <laughs> uh, subgenre to write in. But um, yeah, but with enough iterations, you know, all of that eventually came together as well. And came together wonderfully, if, if I may say so. Uh, the thriller bits, the but like, like I said, you know, it's, it's the mystery bits, like who is the machine hood and what's going on? This is sort of the way it, it, it drives it. And, you know, and those little things at the beginning of each chapter, which, you know, sort of gives us a glimpse into what's really going on, that, that really helped a lot. Uh, Vijay? You're on mute, huh? Thank you, Shanali. And uh, yes, I mean, the thriller bits really did come together really well because the pacing is perfect and, you know, it really does hold that uh, all the ideas together. And one of the ideas uh, in the book, which you mentioned is, you know, the future of work. And I was especially intrigued by how machinehood blends this current social media driven influencer economy with the gig, gig economy. And comes up with this world where, you know, one's job, daily life, interests, everything are constantly being uh, monetized and spied on. And this in turn leads to work itself becoming a performance. Like Velga says at one point that we are performing a service and the keyword being performed. And which means that she has to get hurt on the job because that's what her audience wants to see. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about how you visualize this um, economy, which is both intimate yet strangely impersonal and kind of dehumanizing at some point. Yeah, um, uh, as you said, 100% uh, inspired by you know current events. Uh, I drafted Machine Hood in 2017, so things are changing very rapidly. But I think you know we can still see the uh, impact that social media has had on. The way many of us live, especially you know, upcoming generations, their assumptions about the type of work they can do and their earning power on the internet. And, um, and again, kind of weaving in with this idea of how are people going to earn a living, right? Uh, one of the things we've seen over the past century is or, or even half century is the the growth in entertainment industries right look at the video game industry which didn't even exist um 100 years ago and today is just a huge part of uh, that particular sphere right uh the number of people being employed in terms of digital arts in terms of creation self-publishing for books um we can see that everybody is becoming a creator and they're finding more and more ways to micro monetize. So rather than having, you know, a hundred regularly published authors or, you know, 10 movie stars, we have, 
YouTube stars, TikTok stars, Twitch stars, right? So many different ways, but everybody's getting a little bit less of a share. And so that integrated with kind of where I was seeing the gig economy develop, especially uh, four or five years ago. And I was like, well, this could be a way for people to kind of piece together a living, right? You know, you have all these different income streams and they aggregate into something where you have enough earning power to go through and pay your rent and buy your food. And so thinking about that and thinking about the erosions of data privacy and the amount of content that people put on social media uh, with very little concern for um, how that's being used, you know, the fact that they're exposing very deeply personal things and how it's become expected almost, right? You're supposed to be authentic on social media. You are supposed to kind of bear your heart. So why not just be on camera all the time if it's available, right? Rather than having to pick up your phone and record yourself, just have cameras everywhere. Um, and the flip side of that is uh, what it does in terms of transparency and kind of a, an almost libertarian view of information sharing, right? In that rather than the government having a one-way um, ability to surveil the population, it's a two-way system where we can surveil what's happening in public on the streets. We can surveil what's happening with our government officials. There's no more secret, you know, city council meetings, right? How does that then change the dynamics of society and does the, the benefits gained from that kind of transparency become sufficient that it's worth trading off, you know, potentially having a camera in your bathroom, right? And you not even knowing who's watching. So yeah, so I, I really kind of wanted to show that and and I had fun with the idea of wanting to shock people because if you look at morality and what's considered, you know, good moral behavior and how that's evolved over time, what's what is acceptable in society to show of your body, of your actions. Um, I wanted to kind of pause it, okay, let's create this future that we would find shocking, that we would find very uncomfortable to live in. But those people are totally fine with it, right? Um, I mean, imagine 200 years ago, the idea of two people, two gay people openly living together, unmarried and raising children, right? Um, today, very few people are going to bat an eyelash. You know, there's always going to be some people who are scolding, but generally speaking, it's acceptable, not too big of a deal. Um, that kind of thing, but you know, 75 years from now, what are the behaviors that are completely socially acceptable and normative that you know today would be um, uncomfortable? And so, I had fun kind of coming up with ways to challenge the reader's assumptions and, you know, put yourself in the headspace of these people that are living this way and, and think uh, how it might be okay, actually. Hmm. No, I mean, that, that, that was one of those things, like, I mean, you, you really have like zero, zero privacy, right? Anybody can switch on and watch you do anything. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, so probably maybe it'll make people be better. And like you mentioned, because of all this crime, et cetera, and all has sort of come down in that world because you never know who's watching you doing what. Uh, and since we have mentioned about the dehumanizing of uh, that whole thing, I want to talk about the whole non-human part of it. And, you know, uh, in, in design, for example, there's this concept of the negative space, right? And, uh, the negative space in, in, in machinehood is provided by the caliphate, which is on the side of the pills and you know biogenetic uh, augmentation rather than this one. And just sort of like a, a black hole uh, in, in, in the book, which sort of acts as a stand-in for many of us, of many of the people today who worry about a Skynet happening. Right. <laughs> I mean, as of, I, I think like two days ago was the anniversary of Skynet going live. Right. Oh, was uh, it? Yes. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and you know, even after the, the machine hood starts with its manifesto, you know, people uh, uh, are still afraid of of sci or sentient, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, as you call it. So I, I don't know whether that makes it a cyberpunk novel, but anyway. Uh, so I just wanted to say. So the, so. even with that kind of the thing the people are afraid of 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 non human intelligence right for somebody who's in that world of, of that you created in machine hood who's grown up with vks with bots being so ubiquitous and doing everything for you and you're keeping up with the bots uh, and you you can't do without your own personal assistant i mean you 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 can't function without your own personal assistant even for a person at that to feel the fear that i mean this is where probably good ss speaks to the fears of its age which is now even though it's 2095 it's uh, you know how, how does that work i was just wondering you know i think people uh, are always afraid of the ways in which technology can be exploited um even automobiles right uh, people were very afraid of them and driving them early on there were accidents they were terrible uh, and yet we continue to produce cars and more and more people learn how to drive we increase the number of safety measures uh to where you know everyone's comfortable driving a car but it's still one of the uh statistically highest ways of dying is in an automobile accident and yet every day you know lots and lots of us get into a car or on a moped and we get out on those streets and put our lives at risk and um and so i i kind of think of it in that sense you know of uh artificial intelligence technology robots um you know our mach- smarter every day right we're putting more and more technology into them but it's that sort of um frog in a pot of boiling water analogy right where it it happens so incrementally that the things that are every day in our lives become ordinary and non-threatening but those same things can still have a sort of id level you know fear in terms of what can be done with them so when we um when we think about car accidents it's still a terrifying thing right nobody nobody likes the idea of it we try to push it back but it's always there when we think of our refrigerator suddenly becoming sentient in a horror movie and <laughs> doing something terrible you know that's still there right most of us will dismiss it we're still going to use our refrigerators but there's always that you know that hint in the imagination of like what if this tool that is under our control suddenly becomes out of control and so that's kind of where i've set this particular future and that's where i think no matter how comfortable we get with robots in our lives and how uh non-threatening we make them when we manufacture them how many safety features we put in uh, there's always going to be that that small bit of doubt that you know what if all of those things fail and something happens and it's terrible and uh, and you know people like scary stories right so that i think that particular uh, boogeyman will always be uh, in our general consciousness just like nuclear warfare although it is not as um as forward as it was in the 1980s for example in terms of pop culture consciousness it's still there you know uh, many many post apocalyptic stories are still after some sort of nuclear holocaust nowadays it's equally likely maybe to be a climate holocaust as a nuclear holocaust but that hasn't gone away we still have the bombs they're still sitting there someone can still push the button right so um i guess that's kind of how i see why people of our future are still going to be afraid of some super intelligent self aware ai and in some ways maybe even more so because at that point it's so integrated into the into their lives you know the lives of the characters in machine hood they don't know how to live without these forms of technology such that if that did happen um it would be even worse right for them thank you divya um that was 
really interesting answer and i really appreciate uh, how in the acknowledgments of the book you've kind of thanked uh, you know all uh, uh, you know all the beings that support our world biological and machine mindless and mindful and given that in pop culture we see a lot of this you know oh we should be afraid of the machines kind of approach this is really refreshing and very hopeful um I, like you said i one of the reasons why uh, people are still afraid is because we can't predict uh, how this uh, thing is going to evolve but then it's you know like you may, uh, have spoken before it's also our responsibility uh, to raise them right so to speak i mean i'm quoting from a recent tweet of yours uh, you know where you where you were tweeting a critique of the boston dynamic dynamics bots and you said that even if and when they gain self awareness it is our responsibility to raise them right so to speak your sentient dog isn't allowed to bite people your sentient child isn't allowed to hit other children you have to teach your robot socially acceptable behavior now given that ai ethics is a big part of machine hood and we've been talking about that i'd like you to tell us a little bit more about this how how do we raise them right exactly what do we do yeah so i guess you know in to go back to what you were saying at the start of this I have hope with these uh devices in part because I work on them um not so much the robots but you know the software side of machine intelligence uh I studied computational neuroscience back in the 90s you know it's always been uh, one of my core interests is machine learning and and how do we make um devices more intelligent and maybe because i have that intimate knowledge um i'm i'm very aware of two things uh one everything that comes out of the box is driven by what we put into the box right a lot of people you know talk about uh artificial neural networks as black boxes but we don't really know what's happening inside and what they mean is we don't have like a closed form equation to describe you know how the inputs map to the outputs that said we are training them they are just adaptive mathematics and we're training the parameters in them based you know with what data we feed into them and what outputs we would like them to produce for a given input and um and so that is an ethical responsibility that people are talking about today in the tech world right um you know all the failures we've seen with facial recognition systems down to simple things like the sensors in your hand washing sink um you know all of these things have to be calibrated in certain ways and so what data you feed in you know what parameters you choose for those calibrations will affect then um how human beings interact with that system and the other part of it is you know this idea that either spontaneously or through our own invention these machines will become uh conscious and self-aware the way that life forms are and then they'll be very upset because of how we've treated them and so they will rise up in some sort of uh violent you know slave type of rebellion right um and that is i would say the neuroscience side right in terms of um what we know today about the brain about consciousness about self-awareness is very very limited we we still don't have a very good understanding of it we still have only very rough models of it and so the idea that we're going to be able to produce that in a machine is still a fairly nebulous one i would say in a lot of ways it's like flying cars in science fiction you know it's like yes we can build a car that flies but not in the easy peasy anti gravity way that um we see typically in most science fiction the same thing is is true of robots at this moment and i think even for the foreseeable uh near future next century or possibly even to um spontaneous emergent consciousness highly unlikely and so Yeah so I I I was trying to kind of keep everything uh you know very very grounded and realistic with this particular 
book. Does that answer your question? I think I kind of went off track of it. <laughs> no, yeah. It, 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 yeah. When speaking of being grounded, right, uh, brings me to this uh, idea. I mean, you know, uh, just to switch track a bit from the AI to the, what can I say, the literal industrialization of the human experience, if I can call it that, or human labor. Uh, you know, uh, the, the utopian ideal or, you know, uh, an utopian sci-fi or when, when people talk about automation, they're like, don't worry, you know, uh, robots and the bots and automation will take care of all the drudge work and then human beings will be free to follow their passion and their interests and do what they really love, you know. But I like how you keep it grounded that instead of doing all of, all of these things that indulging in our passions and doing poetry or you know sitting sipping chai in the himalayas people are actually in 2095 just sort of augmenting themselves more and more with these pills with with the zips and the buffs and uh, and the flows just so that they can compete with the the with the bots or you know and that, that too in a sort of a gig economy where there's really no contract and it's you know it's it's a it's very tenuous in nature and all of that uh, and then you know, there's no government support in terms of a contract, uh, right? So you still have to work and you still have to compete, you know, and, and the whole, you know, so any thoughts out of you as to why you kept it so grounded? Uh, and, and, yes. and, and, and your approach to general uh, labor rights, because that that's, that to me was a large, large part of, of the book as well as, as the, the value of human labor and of human skill, uh, you know, and, and of people. Yeah, I, I was, uh, one of the things that I was doing as part of my research and reading was looking at, um, you know, a hundred years ago, the labor rights revolution of the, you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s, right? And what was happening to work and the human workforce at that time, because we went through a big upheaval about a century ago, with uh, factories and automation, but also the rise of, um, you know, office work. And it's funny because I think I want to say like in the 19 teens or maybe the early 20s, there were uh, economists and philosophers saying very similar things. They're saying, oh, we don't have to toil in the fields anymore. You know, the tractors and the machines will be um, automating all our farm labor. And then we have um, these other factories that are going to be much more efficient at producing the goods we want. And so people can sit around and they're only going to have to work 15 hours a week. And we will finally bring the leisure class to everyone. They can do art, they can produce literature, right? They, they said the exact same thing 100 years ago. And, and when I read that, it was like, you know, the, the switch went off in my head where I was like, oh my God, this is just, this is what's going to happen again, right? You know, we're going through the same thing right now with like automation and AI is going to take over our jobs and what are people going to do? And so, you know, the, the less skilled labor force is in a panic somewhat rightfully so, just like the 75% of the world that was in the agrarian world 100 years ago. And the uh, academics and, you know, wealthier people are sitting there going, no, you all get to finally join us and, you know, kick back. And I'm thinking, well, capitalism being what it is, um, we have an uneven distribution of wealth, which means the people holding the money are going to want to increase their wealth. And so they're going to find ways to employ people somehow. And this labor force is not gonna get liberated. We're gonna find other ways for them to work with the AI or around the AI. And there will be entirely new economies. So that's where actually a lot of the pills and the biotech idea came in was much like what um, computers and technology did for the 20th century coming into now, I think, um, biotechnology, genetic engineering will become somewhat more commoditized, uh, at least in the future of machinehood. Uh, and I, I think it's, a, it's quite plausible and likely that that's going to be, you know, the revolutionary technology of this coming century. It's either biotech or it's going to be climate tech. I don't know which one will become more pressing. Um, possibly both. 
But when you have those kinds of uh, emergent new technologies, they tend to create their own economic ecosystem of producers and consumers. And so that kind of becomes a large part of where I see the labor force ending up. And as part of it, you know, we're going to need to change our educational system, much like we did 100 years ago, you know, with increases in availability of um, basic schooling, right? You know, everybody had to become literate, everybody had to learn basic mathematics. These were things that people didn't necessarily have or require, you know, a couple hundred years ago, you don't need to know how to read and write to uh, tend the cows or plow the fields. But you do to go sit in an office um, and write memos. <laughs> and so um, people will need, you know, more literacy in certain types of uh, science. You know, we see it already with more and more people learning how to code and making you know, the tools to make that easier for the average person to pick up. And so um, this idea that everyone's going to be scrambling for income, that they're still going to be working and possibly working harder than they are today, that they're going to have to take these pills that have maybe not the best health consequences. Um, that was just me kind of looking at how history repeats itself. You know, every time we've had a revolution, uh, every time we've had social upheaval, whether it was communism, whether it was going from monarchy to democracy, um, we still end up with, unfortunately, uh, small, you know, concentrations of power and largely exploited labor forces. And so, yeah, that was, a, that's, it sounds very depressing when I, when yeah, I can no, say it like that. Like, the more things change, the more they remain the, the same. The uh, same, uh, yeah. It, and so it's I, just, it's a different flavor of, um, capitalistic uh, 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 economics, you know? I, I, I don't know who was it to remark. And it's easier to sort of imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Uh, one last comment uh, 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 before uh, we, we, we go uh, to the reading. Uh, one thing is this, uh, uh, those of you who have questions, you're typing them in the chat. We'll take them in after the reading. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, please type your questions in the chat on YouTube and uh, we'll take them on here. Uh, so one last thing before we move on to the uh, reading is I, I love the way uh, you didn't sort of exoticize Indian culture and uh, or even italicize words like Gopuram or Sambar or Murka and didn't explain what it was. I loved it best. Whoever wants can go, uh, uh, you know, figure it out. Otherwise, you know, uh, usually it's Sambar is uh, uh, italicized. And even if it isn't, it's like the next sentence will have an explanation of what Sambar is, you know, spicy lentil curry, you know, spicy Indian lentil curry. That wasn't there. So thank you uh, <laughs> for, for that. So, I mean, something like this is wouldn't probably have been non-italicized Gopurams and Murkus probably wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. And I'm sure things have changed. Was it easier? Was it a conscious decision? Uh, you know? Things have changed, uh, especially in the, the last decade. Um, there has been a shift in US publishing away from italicizing uh, non-English words, because as long as it's written in the English alphabet, it's fair game as a word. And, and so many of our words, I mean, pretty much the whole English language is kind of a mishmash of other languages to begin with, right? And so uh, it, I think, there's enough, whatever, multiculturalism, diversity, et cetera, in terms of both uh, the writers, but also the readership at this point that's become very global, that it's kind of superfluous. It's like we don't need to italicize a word, let it just become part of the, the lexicon of um, English as it is in, you know, in the entire uh, global internet economy, right? So, um, Magazines, most, I think probably at this point, many, many book publishers as well have stopped that practice of, you know, it's a foreign word, it needs to be italicized, is, is gone. The, the explanation part is a little trickier. And um, 
I think that's getting easier, but I think it also depends on how critical it is to understand the meaning of those words to being able to move through the story. You know, in, in the case of machinehood, things like things like Gopuram and Chappa, it's like, yeah, you don't, it's not like integral to the plot. You know, if you don't really know what they're talking about, you can just kind of read on and you'll be fine. Um, it's there to add uh, flavor. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, to, to the world building, like authenticity, right? And there's always going to be details that some people don't know. And there's always cultural context uh, and references in anything that you write that some part of your audience is going to be unfamiliar with, whether it's because of their age, whether it's because of their uh, locale, whether it's because of their family dynamics, you know. And so, um, so I didn't have to... Uh, most of the editors for this were fine with most of what was going on. There were a couple of things raised um, kind of at the like copy edit proofreading stage where they were like, it's not entirely clear from context what this word is refer this non, you know, American word is referring to. Uh, do you want to uh, provide some clarity? And I was kind of like, mm, I looked at it and I was like, no, I'm not going to explain what it is. I will just, um, make it have enough scaffolding so that you know at least whether I'm talking about food or clothing or a mode of transportation. And then after that, you know, like you said, you know, it's, it's up to the reader to go and look it up if they're curious. I had in the, the early on, I was still, when I was still looking at uh, Goodreads comments, cause there weren't that many of them and I wanted to, to read the good ones. Um, somebody, had written that um, she was really intrigued by all these foods. And so she had gone to look it up. She's like, there's so many foods listed in this book that I've never heard of. <laughs> and so, um, so I thought that was fun. You know, it's like, it's that kind of thing. It's like, if you're inspired, you know, go, go and read up on it. None of these are, are me inventing whole new things. They're all in existence. So for the people who know, they know. And for the people who don't, um, maybe they get to discover, you know, and make their first uh, part of awesome. Why not? Yeah, I, I, I know. I mean, it's, it's always good to discover Indian cuisine, but while on the course of cuisine, I'm not a fan of capsicum sambar. So just, just on the record. <laughs> For the record? <laughs> For the record. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody else um, uh, reach out to me and talk about the, the little bit in there about... Um, uh, tenga chutney, you know, coconut chutney, and and when they only have uh, frozen tomatoes, and you know, tomato Nitya chutney. decides, yeah, let's let's wait until we have fresh coconut before we make chutney. <laughs> <laughs> Love, lovely details, lovely details. I mean, all I can see is tenga I chutney, want tenga that chutney. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, everybody I mean, wants the kitchen of the future for sure, and uh, and I think a lot of people want the. Uh, the smart makeup and the smart clothing as well that, you know, reconfigures itself or you spray on and the makeup just does its thing perfectly to your face. I'm like, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Conveniences, you know. Anyway, uh, Divya, can you go into the reading now, please? Yeah. Words. Yeah. So we have a very, uh, engaged audience is a lot of questions so we'll take that yeah. the audience will take the questions after the reading reading all yes. right okay so i'm gonna read um from the first part of chapter four the the first three chapters kind of draw you into this main thriller plot and introduce um the main character of welga ramirez uh, but it's it's kind of a very fast uh, tightly woven three chapters so a lot of times for my readings, I skip ahead to chapter four where we meet Nitya for the first time. And um, I think we have enough context from what we've talked about so far that things should be pretty clear. So chapter four, Nitya. We built software that passed the basic Turing test nearly a hundred years ago. We have whys that speak of themselves in the first person bots that can navigate from a charging station to their place of work. And yet nobody thinks wise or bots are sentient. We're still waiting for an AI to stand up for itself, to say, I think 
therefore I am. Give me liberty or give me death. We look for a desire for self-determination as proof of sentience. No one has successfully programmed an AI to behave this way in a convincing fashion. But I believe we're very close, within a decade at most, to seeing this. Min Wu, PhD Computational Philosophy, lectures on the artificial mind, expert rating, 97.8 out of 100, UC Berkeley Press, October 2087. Nithya's fingertips moved through the virtual desktop of her office space, opening research results from Asia Pacific's International Medical Journal, adjusting the metabolic parameters in her simulation, pulling in an updated code block from her current contract holder, Synaxel Technologies. They funded designs for pills, the tiny biomech biomechanical machines that could affect everything from intracellular transport to DNA and RNA editing. She'd worked on multiple projects for them, primarily with Juvers for muscle recovery and repair. <clears throat> A triple dose of flow kept Nithya's mind from losing the multiple threads of thought. Her agent, Sita, worked on the background tasks that Nithya assigned her. Sita wasn't the most expensive Y design, but she could handle the information sorting. Nithya usually had her agent sift through a steady stream of simulation data from other corporations and freelancers, only bringing items of interest to her attention. At the moment, she'd set Sita to trawl for reports that might relate to her sister-in-law's data. While those records made little sense to her, the tremors implied a neuromuscular problem and that pointed to zips as the likely culprit. But why now? What had built up after a decade of use? Or was her sister-in-law's condition something genetic and age the trigger? Neurology lay outside Nithya's expertise, but she could muddle through the high-level research. If she made enough headway, she might even earn some tips for the work. God knew they needed the extra income. Luis used to earn the bulk of his money from context tagging gigs, marking up visual media with labels that made sense to AIs. But those opportunities had dropped in recent years as Wise became better at interpreting human body language. He took any other work he could find and he still got decent tips from rocket launches especially after Eko Yi Station declared independence from India and China's joint governance. With five sovereign space stations and half a dozen others, the population in space had grown to several thousand. They needed supplies, trash removal, and passenger transports. Private rocketry clubs like Luis's could provide those, but the tips didn't amount to much. Certainly not enough to save up for Karma's gear. What a world they lived in, where good schooling required networked jewels for children. On top of all that, Mithya's period was two days late. Probably due to stress, but it fed her anxiety. They couldn't afford for her to be pill-free and out of work for a year. Not now. There are multiple reports of attacks by a new protest group, Sita announced. Casualties include flagged family member, Olga Ramirez. It took Nithya a second to recall that Olga was Welga. Luis had mispronounced his elder sister's name as a toddler and the ridiculous nickname had stuck. Nithya shifted her focus from her visual to her husband who sat by the balcony, a disassembled bot at his side. His jaw had gone slack, his gaze blanked to his visual. No doubt his agent had alerted him already. She stood and peered around the soundproof wall that separated her work alcove from her daughter's. An assortment of colorful blocks sat on Karma's desk next to something that looked like a pyramid built by Gaudi. Karma pointed her haptic feedback gloves at the structure as her lips formed silent words. Virtuality goggles covered half her face. Nithya used parental controls to check Karma's feeds, all school-related. 
Thank God they hadn't interrupted the children with the news. She expanded some live feeds from the site of Welga's injury and watched a medical team break through the floor of a hotel room. Are you seeing this? Lewis sent via silent text. Yes, Nithya replied. They usually avoided speaking to each other or karma during the school day, except for breaks. But Nithya felt extra grateful for the discretion now. She couldn't suppress her gasp as new microdrone feed showed the extent of the explosion and Welga's burned body. Experts weighed in before the medical team made an official report. Welga ought to live. Same with her partner, Connor, and a third team member, someone new. A minute later, the alerts roared to life again with the confirmation of Briella Jackson's death and Jason Kwan's. Alexander Ortega, too. Three of the world's wealthiest people brutally murdered by assailants who then explosively killed themselves. Nithya sent Luis another message. They killed the funders. What kind of madness is this? Horrible, her husband replied. But I'm sure they'll be caught. No one gets away with murder on camera. Rumors flew of a sentient artificial intelligence and the world's first lifelike androids. The machine hood's wide cast threat glared from the lower right of Nithya's visual. Blessings from the machine hood. Seize all pill and drug production by March 19, or we will make it happen. A new era awaits mankind. She expanded the smaller text below it. The time has come to end the distinction between organic and inorganic intelligence. All of us are intelligent machines. All of us deserve the rights of personhood. We appeal to the rest of humankind to follow these principles. And while we prefer a peaceful transfer of power, history proves that human beings will not relinquish their ownership of other intelligences. We believe that the rights of machinehood can only be taken by force. We hereby declare our intention to ensure our rights by any and all means necessary. Humans of this universe, you have a choice. Stand with the machinehood or render yourselves extinct. Wonderful. Now guys, you see why well, you have to have to have to read this book. Uh, so we'll just go on to the, the questions. The first one, uh, Vishwajit asks, uh, who apologizes in advance for having read only a small, small part of the book. And in case you already answered his question in the book, which I think, you, I mean, which you have. Uh, but his question is, where would you draw the line between human conscious intelligence and artificial intelligence? Uh, not just the current state, which is narrow, but what it could be a hundred years from now. Uh, do you ever believe the line would completely disappear in the future? Yeah, um, yes, the, the book definitely addresses this particular question. And I think uh, the latter third of it really explores it in depth. But, you know, there's, there's a distinction being made in the neuroscience community between intelligence and consciousness. So um, it's interesting that, you know, uh, in the question, uh, it's human conscious intelligence, right? So human-like intelligence, because we're already seeing that machines and machine intelligences can be very sophisticated, can do things that human brains can't do very well and can do it better than us sometimes. And then there are other tasks that, you know, are very intuitive for us and more challenging. But in terms of just intelligence as in being able to move through and interact with the world and react to it. Um, definitely, I think uh, artificial intelligence will catch up and might even surpass in a, in a, even in a general intelligence sense. The conscious part is the one that's more tricky. And um, that's where I'm less certain that we will ever have conscious uh, machines of our own construction, because until we can figure out what consciousness is, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to 
recreate it. And some people think that if you if you have a sufficiently complex model of the brain, it's equivalent, but there are other people who think that a model will never be equivalent to the reality, that it's um, that there are things with uh, a physical neuronal system that can never be reproduced by a model. So that is a very open question, I think. Thank you, uh, Divya, for that. Um, our next question is from Suchitra who says, hey, Divya, great book. Loud how you juxtapose the Luddite fear with the myth of Frankenstein. Could you talk us through how you came up, came up with the plot? And she also has another question where she says, can you talk about to us a bit about how you imagine sentience as a spectrum? How do you visualize the degrees of sentience? Okay, so how I came up with the plot, <laughs> as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the plot was somewhat highly iterated. I, I, knew, uh, I knew how the book was going to start. I knew how I wanted it to end. And I knew who the primary protagonists and antagonists were. But the, the intricacies and the twists and turns kind of uh, got worked out over time. But ultimately, I knew in terms of the conflicts that I really wanted to show, you know, the, that central labor conflict, and then um, this more sort of uh, existential question of machine intelligence versus uh, human beings, both in terms of work, but also just in terms of pure existence. And so, uh, and, and so that's where, yeah, that, that fear factor came in. And, um, you know, as, as Shinoi was saying, there's so many stories in which the AI or the robot is the sort of um, terrible, scary thing out to get us. And I really wanted to take that trope, uh, start the book with it and kind of hook people with that, but then you know, really turn it on its head and examine both why we have these fears and um, what a more realistic uh, AI story could be in terms of science fiction. And for the, for the second question, um, degrees of sentience is something that, you know, we can absolutely observe today, right? You know, down from uh, like bacteria and paramecium that move through the world, you know, all the way up to human beings, dolphins, elephants, you know, the higher order um, chimpanzees, intelligences and um, self-aware life forms that we have today. And so that's really kind of where I see that we already have a spectrum, both of level of consciousness, right? In terms of awareness of the world and sophistication in terms of how we, how we model the world in our own brains um, to uh, capability, right? Um, you know, we have, we have hive intelligences, we have individual intelligences, we have ant-like, insect-like um, forms of intelligence. And, and then we have, you know, tool making uh, animals versus non tool making animals. So we can see just on earth that there's, there's quite a great diversity, both of um, sentience or, or consciousness and just intelligence in terms of capability. And so um, that was a lot of the parallels um, that I tried to draw uh, philosophically in this book. You know, it's, there's, there's a spectrum in our living world there, can certainly become a spectrum in the artificially intelligent or machine intelligent world as well. Yeah, and then this search for intelligence and the way we look at it, you know, it sort of also reminds me of Ted Chiang's The Great Silence, you know, we're looking for the intelligence out there in the stars and, you know, and the, the, the parakeets of SSC were saying like, we're right here, we're also intelligent. Why aren't you looking at us? Why aren't you trying to communicate with us and instead of always looking, you know, always at the stars? Uh, anyway, uh, the next question comes from uh, TCV. He asks, do you see a deep chasm between wealthy and middle low-income countries in, adopt in the adoption of robotics and AI? Uh, will an international charter that creates a structure to soften the blow of job losses and social upheavals be 
helpful mostly through intervention and not leave everything to the quote unquote market forces yeah um that's a very interesting question uh we could probably spend an hour <laughs> an entire conference talking about that but um you know the the chasm is i think forming somewhat already in part because uh robots especially need a lot of uh material resources right it's a, it's a physical object that has to be constructed and therefore is costly and you can also see that you know the need for robot labor is different depending on the population so in the US or Japan compared to a place like India or Mexico you know there are places where you have high density of human labor force that ultimately is going to be cheaper than building a really sophisticated robot to do that same thing at least you know for the next few decades and so yeah i i think um i think the chasm will definitely be there from that standpoint that said software pure software machine intelligence i think less so because this that can pretty much you know run on your phone at this point right which almost everybody has a smartphone now um even in you know rural and poorer areas it's become an essential tool of modern life and so there's a lot of ubiquity there so i think having ai in your in terms of software integrated with your life that actually might not have so much of a gap between uh wealthier nations and and less wealthy nations state intervention could get very interesting right you know there's a lot of talk about universal basic income other types of assistance i think there's another way that um state intervention can go which is to for example forbid the use of uh robotic labor in certain sectors in order to protect the human workers in those sectors um where that ends up going and whether we you know let capitalism uh, and market forces just kind of run their course or whether we take more intervention is going to depend on you know the political will of this next century and i'm honestly i don't know if i want to predict where that's going because it's been very unpredictable <laughs> um in recent times and whether we're going to have another sort of you know socialist revolution and whether those socialist forces will really push back on um free market economics uh tbd i think there there's a lot more social and political will behind uh greater safety nets but whether that's going to be enough to hit globally um and whether there's going to be cooperation there or whether the the competitions uh, international competition will again kind of drive us to a a crappy local minimum that i think uh, is is very hard to foretell true i mean and i am glad you said you know you can't talk so much about the next century or whatever and and, and i don't know if you you all notice like you know uh, even in the early part of the 20th century and through the thing everyone kept referring to the 21st century you know the age to come and the 21st century and all and it's nobody talks that much about the 22nd century nobody really brings it up at all it's not part of the mainstream consciousness as the 21st century was in the 20th it's just a observation. Hey, well, you know though, I think that's because at least for for some of us growing up in the, you know, the end stages of the 20th century we were looking forward. I think it 50 years from now people are going to be talking more about the 22nd century. Right now is too far away, right? I mean, it's as hard enough to predict what's going to happen 20 or 30 years from now. looking 100 years from now is basically an exercise in science fiction right like you can you can make up all kinds of stuff but the branches are so so wide and there's so many different places we can end up and there are so many disruptive um events uh, that can come along we we still have all of climate change to deal with and who knows you know um there's 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 ways we can envision how that can go but there's many ways that it can go so some of those could have a huge impact on things like economic forces and political forces so yeah it's uh 
I think it's it's too far away to talk about the 22nd century <laughs> right now, and and so it's not present in our in our conversations. And then you and machine wood is like just five years before the 21st yeah. century. Very clever. <laughs> I was originally actually set in um, in twenty one fifteen, and then I rolled it back because I was like, "Oh, too many of these things that I have in machinehood are going to happen way sooner." And I, I was actually wanting to roll it back even closer to like twenty fifty or twenty sixty, but then um, my character generational stuff didn't work out. So I was like, "Fine, fine." Sometimes things take longer than we want, anyway. So uh, twenty ninety five was a good compromise. <laughs> Oh, muted, Chennai. Vijay, ah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we have quite a few questions from Siddharth. I think some of them have already been answered, but uh, I'm going to take a couple of his interesting ones. Uh, he says that he loved everything about the novel, except maybe the Chitti's characterization. <laughs> what he did love is the neo-Buddhism stand of the uh, stand of the novel. And he's asking how much of Buddhism did you have to grok to get that right? And uh, he also loves the poster behind you. And what is that? He'd like to know. Yeah, I'll also answer his second question real quick, which is a uh, uh, Homo Deus by uh, Yuval Noah Harari, which I really loved that book, but I actually read it um, after I wrote Machine Hood. So uh, it did not influence, but uh, I was really excited when I was reading because I was like, yes, this guy gets it. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to get him a copy of the book to review, but couldn't find uh, any way to reach him through my network. Um, for the Neo-Buddhism stuff, uh, I, I've had a, I, I think I've always had an interest both in, in you know, uh, Hindu philosophy and then the way Buddhist philosophy kind of derives from that and expands and goes in its own directions. And then I spent a decent amount of time uh, researching a little bit more in depth into, especially into the, um, the, the Dakini, um, which are, I think that a much bigger role uh, is played in Buddhism than in uh, Hinduism. So, uh, so I spent a decent amount of time in there. Um, did I get Neo-Buddhism right? I had at least one Buddhist read the book who thought it was, it was decent, um, but I'm sure there's going to be people out there who uh, might find nits to pick because I didn't have a wide variety of Buddhists read it. So hopefully I got it, you know, mostly right. And I was trying to be um, respectful. I didn't want to demonize uh, any religion in this book. And there is a lot of religion in this book more than is typical for science fiction. And as for the poster, um, I think we talked about it briefly in the, oh no, maybe we talked about it before we started. Um, but I was, uh, I was supposed to go on the Joko cruise um, last year, which uh, is nicknamed the Nerd Cruise. And it's basically like a floating, you know, Comic-Con type thing almost. And um, this was before the book was out and before I really had any promotional materials for it. So I worked with a friend to do a logo and I was going to like put out flyers and kind of have like some fun marketing opportunities. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm like noticing the, the sun is coming in my window. Um, and so I worked with a graphic designer friend to come up with the logo and uh, the cruise was set to depart on the first weekend of March, 2020. So um, needless to say, uh, I did not go on the cruise. It that didn't get canceled. People actually went um, and they returned. It was one of the very last cruises to sail and return. Um, but I didn't go for various reasons, uh, including all pandemic related ones. And um, luckily they, they credited those of us who, who skipped out. And so hopefully I will be going next year and maybe I'll still do some guerrilla marketing though. By then the book will have been out for an entire year. So we'll see. Right, uh, I think we have time for just one last question. Um, if you're okay, Divya. Yeah. Um, so uh, Tarun asks, uh, you know, he makes a comment that E.M. Foster's machine stops, articulates their anxiety about 
like a dependence on machines you know in the story the machines just stop and they're just so uh, dysfunctional without it uh, presents a more dystopian view than bellamy's looking backward from 1888 uh, bellamy's backward of course was proper dream narrative you know uh, sleeps and gets up in a socialist utopia and all of that uh, in so his question is in today's context can we envisage a more hopeful view of the tech mediated future to come perhaps in a solar solar punk mode i hope so um you know it it it's a very interesting question and if you uh if you read the book there not to spoil it too much but there is a moment uh when something like that uh like the machine stops happens and people have to deal with it um i think i think the anxiety is always going to be there uh because because we are aware acutely aware of how dependent we are on technology and how much that dependence is increasing right i mean it 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 started uh 100 150 years ago right between steam engines and um and then later the automobile but now you know with computers and cell phones and can we have you know a, a solar punk mediated future where the technology is there but maybe we're less reliant on it uh is a really interesting question it's one that i'm exploring a little bit in the next novel i'm working on a little bit but i think i think the way to get there is going to end up being um genetic and biological means so basically using more organic technology so to speak right building things um that are basically life rather than artificial life uh, and modifying what we already have and so that brings with it you know its own host of uh, perils and opportunities but i think that that would probably be at least my personal solar punk vision of the future is that rather than mining and extracting and building you know things out of inorganic materials we find ways to harness the power of life that's already all around us it's a nice hopeful optimistic way to end uh, you know today's session yes yes um, thank you so much uh, divya i mean like chana was mentioning earlier the machine hood itself is such a hopeful book uh, you know given everything else so thank you for writing it and uh, thank you for coming and speaking to us today uh, it's i mean this conversation was fascinating and i really enjoyed it i hope everyone else who's joined in today also enjoyed it um thank you shanoy for being an amazing co-host um thank you, you <laughs> Geek. Thank you, thank you to the Husky team, Zena, David, uh, Jyotsna, everyone who's helped us with uh, everything in the background today. Thank you, of course, to the audience who's been so engaged and for all your great questions. Thank you for making this a great conversation. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you, Diva. Thank you for agreeing to come, and thank you all for giving us uh, uh, an hour of your Friday evening to. listen to us talk about this thing and we'll see you next month on the hasgi kesef book club as always at 7:30 on the last friday of august whatever the date is hope to see you all then again yes bye right. long Take and care. bye, bye.